right, we're in the midst of an overview of the book of Revelation, and we come to the paradox. It means something like an entrance. So we're following, I think Jack said a little earlier, there are several different ways to cut a cake. Okay. Slice bread. Slice bread, that's it. So here's the how we're slicing the book of Revelation this time. Last time we dealt with the prologue and the exodus, that is, the way out. And now we're dealing with the paradox, taking the Greek tragedy, the Greco-Roman theatrical pattern as a possible medium by which John was expressing the visions that the Lord gave him. Today we come to the paradox wherein the main actors of the play are introduced and something about each of them. Then the next few weeks we will deal with the various episodes. Every episode starts with a vision of what's going on in heaven and then how the vision is played out on earth and how all of that then leads eventually to worship towards Yahweh and his Messiah Jesus. And all five of those episodes follow that pattern. The book of Revelation deals with the present time, that is the time when the book was written, and then the book itself lays out a, a temporal framework of a time, times, and half a time, which we take to mean years, because those times are actually defined as 42 months and as 1,260 days. Now, the learning objectives for this morning. First, let's try to identify Jesus' angel. Secondly, to locate the seven churches of Asia Minor. That's pretty easy, we have maps. And then thirdly, to analyze Jesus' approvals, warnings, promises, and predictions to the seven churches. I, John, your brother, who share with you the persecution in the kingdom and the endurance in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches. We have a few observations to make. John said, I share with you in the persecution. Now, we dealt with this last week. But the question here, is this the Neuronic persecution or the Domitianite persecution? Was this book written in the 60s or was it written in the 90s? Or was it some other persecution? We just don't know. In Jesus... What does that modify? Is it just the patience in Jesus? Anyway, grammatically, it could either be modifying, I am your brother in Jesus, which is perfectly grammatical, makes very good sense, but you could also take it as modifying all three of the nouns, persecution and kingdom and endurance in Jesus. That always leaves the question, what does that mean? Persecution in Jesus. But he was on the island of Patmos. The thing to underscore here was that this was an exile. He was not in prison, as far as we know. Just could not leave the island. And apparently he could receive visitors. He had writing materials. He could get alone and be in the spirit for a while. And apparently he could receive messengers from the churches of Asia. I was in exile because of the word of God and because of the testimony of Jesus. Is that the same thing or is this possibly implying that this was because of the Old Testament scriptures that he was teaching along with the Gospels? Uh, if it was the early persecution, the Gospels had not all been written yet. If it was the later persecution, then they had. In any event, what would John possibly know about the gospel? <laughs> Everything. They wrote one. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
he was familiar with all the uh, teachings and events, miracles of Jesus. But apparently, there was some reaction against him because of his teaching. What, what kind of opposition could he possibly have encountered as a, an apostle of Jesus in teaching the Word of God? Yes. As a consequence, Probably had a lot of pushback from the Jewish community. Okay, right, yeah. So the traditional Jews were pushing back against the Messianic Jews. Uh, I guess they still do. <laughs> but then he said, I was in the Spirit. Now, this is one of those problematic expressions throughout the New Testament because we're, we're not always too sure what they're, you're talking about. I in my human spirit, that is in my mind, or in relation to the Lord Jesus in the Holy Spirit. It large, partly depends on whether the Bible translator was a theologian or a linguist. If he was a theologian, then it's the Holy Spirit every time. If you're a linguist, then you're more honest with the text and the anthropology and more likely to go with I was having a spiritual experience, or I was thinking about these things. And more interestingly, on the Lord's Day, well, back up a moment. For the purposes of this book, what difference does it make the day of the week? And when did Christians start calling Sunday the Lord's Day? But just taking the language in the context of the book of Revelation, this phrase, the Lord's Day, or the Day of the Lord, what further meaning could it possibly have? He could be looking into the future Lord's Day. That, that's what he would see, because he was told to see and then tell. Exactly. And the Day of the Lord, as an Old Testament expression that was current in the Jewish community, had to do with the future when God would intervene in history to bring judgment against the nations and would exalt Israel into its place of leadership once again when Messiah would arrive. And so what does the book of Revelation describe? The coming of the Messiah. Coming of Messiah, but a lot of judgment against the wicked nations and the persecutions that the true believers would have to endure uh, from, from time to time uh, throughout those, those ages. So, Which, I've got a question. Yeah. So, in, in our reading you know, for this week, what is, the, what is the significance of the seven churches in, in this writing? Is, it, is this because the region that John was in? Or, okay, so. Yeah, historians tell us that even though it was Paul who planted the church in Ephesus, the Apostle John was eventually called as a kind of teacher, leader, bishop, some would say. And then the, those other churches were daughter churches of the church of Ephesus. Although, not all of the churches in that region are mentioned here. For example, a Colossian, church in Colossae, and Hierapolis, so this was the area where John was exiled to? Uh, yes, in fact, we'll look on the map shortly. Patmos is just off the coast. And I turned to see whose voice it was that spoke to me. And on turning, I saw seven gold lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, I saw one like the Son of Man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash across his chest. Okay, what's the significance of uh, lampstands and golden sashes? There was a lampstand in the tabernacle. Yes, which and, uh, was eventually brought into the temple. The high priest had a sash on his. He did, yeah, and a long robe. The, uh, so what's the picture here? Jesus Glorious is the high Christ. Christ. <laughs> Glorious Christ, the high priest perhaps, perhaps of the new temple in heaven. Although this was something that John actually heard with his ears, and he turned around to see, and he saw somebody. And I'm describing how this chap was dressed. 
So lampstands are actually interpreted for us in verse 20. These represent the seven churches. Why those seven? Possibly because those are the seven who had sent messengers to Patmos to talk with John, maybe bring him his food supply. Yep. Are we talking about the seven churches in this sense of the seven lampstands having to do with the Jewish festival, okay, of the seven seven lampstands? That is like that, that the Jews could relate to this even more closely? You could ask that question. Was this perhaps uh, the festival of lights? I saw someone like a son of man. Why does he say someone like the son of man? This you'd have to know the scriptures pretty well. Because, uh, all right, this phrase, son of man, where did it originate? Daniel. Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, where Daniel said, I saw coming on the clouds someone like a son of man. In other words, what I saw was a human being. All right, it says, the son of man. In the Greek, there is no word the, but also in the Greek version of Daniel, the definite article is not there. So this is actually a direct quotation from the Greek version of Daniel, which follows the Hebrew pretty closely. And later in the book, well, this same one like a son of man will return and rapture the believers off the earth. John is familiar with the whole thing of the fear of God and the whole idea of just casting his face to the ground to deal with this divine entity. In this situation, was he hesitant in terms of dealing with this Son of Man because of the fear of God that there was going to be, that he was dealing with the divinity or that he was, you know, because he, he knows he knows the fear of God, and he doesn't want to mess with it, but, so that when he might say, like the Son of Man. But I'm sorry, I don't yeah, know. No, that. that's a good question. What was the psychology? What was John experiencing? Well, it, he will tell us some of that. And even towards the end of the book, he's going to tell us how that he threw himself down to worship at the feet of an angel and was rebuked for it. Yeah, get on. Yeah. So the robe and the sash, as one of you pointed out, Exodus 28, 4 and 5, this was the costume of the high priest. And Jesus is actually called our high priest in the book of Hebrews, which is the only book that calls him that. And he does 15 times. 14 plus 1. His head and his hair were as white as white wool, white as snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined as in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp, two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun, shining with full force. Wow. Well. Right, what stands out to you? Terror. <laughs> put, the, <laughs> put, the fear, put the fear of Yahweh in. Burnished bronze, refined as in a furnace. You might think cold bronze, but the very fact that the furnace is mentioned here, more likely this was bronze coming fresh out of the furnace, mm -hmm. still shining brightly. What does this seven stars represent? He's going to tell us in a moment, but it won't be very helpful. We'll still have to figure out what his meaning was. The white says uh, intimates purity. Yes. Notice he's, he two comparisons, white as wool, white as snow. And if you ever watch sheep being sheared, that would <coughs> be pretty dirty. His eight eyes were as a flame of fire. How could he see his face? Who could look into the full force of the sun? In the dream that Daniel had earlier about the four kingdoms that were coming, wasn't one bronze? So this is the one who eventually, we know, would replace all of the human kingdoms and would himself receive an everlasting dominion. Compare Daniel chapter 10. I looked up and saw a man clothed in linen with a belt of gold 
the muck has around his waist. His body was like burl, his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of a burning spawn, and the sound of his words like the roar of a multitude. So I was left alone to see this great vision. Right, this is, again, the same Daniel. And this was some kind of a divine being that Daniel had seen. Now, make the parallel with what John is seeing. And why this is important, why this comparison between Daniel and the Revelation, what, what is this signaling to us? It's got a gold belt and a gold sash. So the similarity, there are many of the similarities. Yeah, talking about burnished bronze. Mm -hmm. in both bronze is mentioned in both. Well, it's important that the same person that it saw. All right. They saw. Exactly. So, whatever Daniel has seen, John is now seeing as well. But Daniel said, I looked up and saw a man. Doesn't look, sound like any man I've ever seen. But God was incarnate and born of woman to be a man on earth. Yeah, but he wasn't very shiny, except on the transfiguration. He had, but he hadn't come into his glory yet. That's right. Until, until, until he ascended. All right, let's just point out the fact that throughout the Hebrew Bible, whenever an angel appeared to any human being, what did the angel look like? A man, a person. Yeah, a, person. <laughs> a man, a human. Yeah. yeah. And so, man actually happens to be one of several Hebrew phrases for angelic or divine beings. But you know from the context whether it's a flesh and blood man or something other. And so we just point out, angels appear as humans in the Bible and in other Jewish literature. Some of you have read through the book of Enoch and you get very similar kinds of uh, expressions. Now, let's try to nail down who is this, this glorious being that both Daniel and John saw. Let's just jump right back up to verse 1 of uh, the Revelation. Read that. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. And he made it known by sending his angel to his servant John. Who sent an angel? It has to refer back to Jesus. Right. God gave the message to Jesus, right. and Jesus made it known to his servants through, through his messenger. His messenger to John. Or his, it says, he sent the angel to the servant John. So we have another being involved here. So is that a different angel? Gabriel was considered the angel of the messages to Mary, to other places. I would have assumed is given this message, but is there another angel that would? All right, you're leading up to uh, something interesting here. Let's see if we can identify who this angel is. Actually, we have some biblical parallels or analogies. For example, Exodus 23. Uh, I am going to send an angel in front of you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I have prepared. Be attentive to him and listen to his voice. Do not rebel against him, for he will not pardon you your transgression, for my name is in him. So this was the angel of the Lord, as the scripture often refers to him. And so Yahweh is speaking and saying, this angel, I'm going to put my name in him. What does that mean? My whole being will be present in that angel. <coughs> now remember, Yahweh himself is eternally invisible. Scripture declares no one has ever seen God, nor can you, unless he sends some kind of a visible representation. And in the Hebrew Bible, that representation was called the angel of the Lord. Come to the New Testament, and Yahweh is no longer coming as an angel. He's coming as Jesus. the incarnate Son of God. But the incarnate Son of God now, he turns around and says, I sent my angel to John. 
What does the angel look like? He's a shining being. The glory of God just comes right out through his eyes and his skin. Let's go on and see if we can come up with a hypothesis. Now, obviously, this is going to be my hypothesis. And whether it's true, whether we can find evidence that supports it. Uh, this is very different from almost all evangelical preaching. Preachers tend to pretend, tend to pretend, <laughs> that they have the final answer to everything biblical and theological. I just get up and say it. And if they say it often enough, we'll believe it. And if they can get, get the capital together, they'll start making books and tracts and videos until everybody believes it. Where it'd be far more honest if we would, could just say, Look, guys, I'm trying to understand this. I have an hypothesis. Let's think through this. Is there some other view? Anyway, here's mine. Yahweh God remains forever the invisible spirit. Now, Jordan Peterson says, God is the spirit who reveals himself. I like that. In the Old Testament, or the Hebrew Bible, the angel of the Lord, angel of Yahweh, sometimes appeared to humans in human form. Is that like with Abraham when they came to visit? Exactly. And of course, the commander of the Lord's armies is another instance. <clears throat> so we know the invisible God is able to come as an angel. Thirdly, Yahweh came into the world as a human in the Lord Jesus. So he was able to do more than come as a vision or an angel. He could also come as a human. But then risen from death, Jesus appeared to hundreds of human witnesses as a human being who was able to show his wounds. And except for the, that moment on the Mount of Transfiguration, the risen Christ was not shining like a lamp. He invited folk to come up and touch the wounds in his hands and the spear wound in his side. So Jesus remains in heaven as our high priest. That's, that's where he abides. So therefore, Jesus sent this revelation through his angel who had appeared to Daniel and is now appearing to John. So, was this the angel of the Lord? In this instances, is the angel of the Lord Jesus Christ. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, and the living one. I was dead. You see, I am alive forever and ever, and I have the keys of death and of Hades. Now write what you have seen, what is and what is to take place after this. Ben <coughs> asked a little earlier whether John might throw himself onto the ground in, wor in sheer worship, if not terror, and of course he said that's what he did. I fell at his feet as though dead. Was, wasn't moving. The angel identifies himself now. Who is he? Doesn't say I'm Jesus. He says, "And the living one." The living. All right. The phrase there, the living one. The Greek reflects uh, Exodus chapter three, where Yahweh says, "I live, but now I was dead, and see, I am alive forever." So this is Yahweh, but more particularly, the crucified, risen Messiah, our Lord Jesus Yeshua. He says something very interesting here. And what's the importance of this? I hold the keys of death and Hades. And Satan was you know, the king of the dead. Yes. On his burial, you know, when he was in Hades for three days and basically put Satan and all and all of Satan's minions on notice, basically. Good. Yeah, good. Mm -hmm. I was just meditating on the word keys. Yeah. Um, in, in that day and age, did a normal, everyday person have the use of keys? Had they developed like to that point? Because keys are symbolizes um, a key is something that's used to open something that's locked. Right. Yes. 
And there were locks back in the day and keys, though they tended to be rather big. They didn't have the machinery to refine them down to a small size. And being big, they were visible. But in this case, Satan no longer has sole possession or authority to keep souls locked in Hades. The Lord Jesus now, he's grabbed those keys from Satan. He's opened the doors that are wide open. Exactly, yeah. So he can keep he can keep us out of Hades, but he can also keep the wicked and the damned in the Hades. The keys tends to be symbolic sometimes. It does not doesn't always mean the physical object. So the key I have the key to your future means hey if you listen listen to me, I will tell you how to get there, sort of thing. Right. Uh, we, we, presu we presume that this is all metaphorical, symbolic, but in other words, I had the power and the authority both to damn and to save. So, what else do we learn about Jesus from this passage? God's, oh, Jesus' sovereignty over all of everything. In heaven and earth, yeah. And of course, earth includes the underworld. When John calls it a scheme, is it in worship a little bit, or is it fear? Because he's not saying stand up like the angel did. It appears to be more of a fear. No, there's also another part, too, where in this, where we've read the past, where or coming up, where when, when John knelt down and the angel told him to stand up, that they were both servants. Right, yeah. Well, that will be another angel. Be not afraid. Apparently, he had fallen down into As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, and of the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Angels of the seven churches, are those spirit beings? Some suggest these are the seven archangels, who actually are named in the Book of Enoch. I don't know how accurate Enoch was. Uh, others suggest, no, these are the se seven bishops over the seven churches who are too important to be there that day, but John will write to them. Especially congregations that have a powerful pastor, they like this one. Or were these just messengers who had come from the churches bringing messages to John, and then John is going to turn around and send this document back with them. And they may have all been scribes who could read and write Greek and had brought with them sufficient writing materials. Others have suggest, well, these are just personifications of the churches themselves. The churches are God's messengers <coughs> in the world, the reason for which they're mentioned together. Go ahead. I was going to say, I kind of like the first one, because we know that there's an open heavenly realm uh -huh. of angels and, you know, that thing. A symbol could stand for many things. It could be all of these things. Ah, it could be. Okay. And in the genre of the book of Daniel, or the motif of the book of Daniel, there is a, you know, this picture of a, a, a heavenly battle that's going on while there's an earthly battle going on. You know, it's, it's, it's connected. All right, so there are the, the seven churches that are named, all of them in Western Asia Minor. Here's what we'd like to do over the next few minutes. I'd like each of you to choose a reading partner or two, and then let one of you read an assigned passage, which I shall give you in a moment, and let the other one write notes. We have some pens and pencils around here somewhere. And then stop at any moment and write a verse number and a word or two under each topic that I'm going to give to you in a moment. And after seven minutes, be ready to report on what you found in the passage. A few minutes later. Uh, you haven't finished yet, but that's all right. One of the principles of effective group Bible teaching is never finish. You know, let everybody go away expecting to find more. Oh, let's do this. Who, who is ready to give us a report? A few minutes later.
Now, when I came to faith in Jesus 61 years ago, but one of the main doctrines going around was that the seven churches of the Revelation were really just predictions of future Christian history. And, for example, the church at Ephesus represented the apostolic age. Smyrna, the period of persecutions that would follow in the next century. Pergamon was like the Dark Ages. And then the rise of Catholicism into the ignorance gap. Sardis then from the 99 Theses forwards in the Protestant movement. And then the great missionary age starting in the midst of the 19th century right up until about the close of the 20th century, and the Laodicea, the apostate church, being the present time. What do you think? Is this possible that this was a prediction of future human history, or Absolutely. church history? You don't think so? Well, Neither do I. Uh, here, here's my reasoning. Uh, all those churches existed in John's day, and they all read the Apocalypse. So these were messages to existing churches, not necessarily to future ones. Though those churches began to disappear in the 1500s, and they were all gone within a few decades after they, the Byzantine Empire was conquered by the Ottoman Turks. Then there, there were churches with similar strengths and weaknesses in every century, including our own. And if those were future churches, then readers down through the centuries never knew who, where, or when they were. And lastly, preachers who do not study history often make up ideas for which there is no evidence. And quite frankly, uh, even our evangelicalism is about half truth, half guesswork.